Liftoff of Atlantis and the six-man crew on a Department of Defense flight. miles over Hawaii. Welcome to Atlantis, STS-44. This is Commander Fred Gregory. How are you all doing? I'm Fred Gregory, the commander of STS-44. We are on the shuttle Atlantis, 195 miles above you, and we've just crossed Hawaii, heading for the United States. We've had a very full... Uh, the first day, of course, we launched the defense support satellite. We call it the Liberty. It's an early warning satellite. The rest of the time, we've spent uh, orchestrating moves from the mid-deck to the flight deck. I'm on the flight deck right now doing observations from some of the overhead windows of the flight deck and doing an awful lot of medical experiments uh, for long-duration stay to evaluate the human uh, as a human uh, prepares for long duration stay in space. But I'd like to go on downstairs now and introduce you to the rest of the crew here at STS-44. Gentlemen, this is the crew of STS-44. Good evening. I'm the pilot, Tom Hendricks. Hi, I'm Jim Vaughn, mission specialist number one. Story in this case, mission specialist number two. I'm Mario Renko, mission specialist number three. Tom Hennon, payload specialist. So with that introduction, we'd like to ask you for any questions. Atlantis, stand by for a call from the Johnson Space Johnson Press Center. Johnson Press Center, go ahead with your call. Atlantis, this is the Johnson Press Center. We're ready to begin the press conference. Hi, this is Frank Bass with the Houston Post. I've got a question for Dr. Musgrave. Can you give us an early assessment of how the bioreactor system has worked? This is Mark Corot with the Houston Chronicle for Fred Gregory and Story Musgrave. wonder if you could comment further on your observations of the quality of the Earth's atmosphere. You made some comments earlier today. If you could elaborate on those and sort of compare what you're seeing on this mission with what you've seen on your earlier flights. Earth. We have a lot more clouds today. 
But also a very evident thing is that when you look straight at Earth from the 195 miles that we are now, you see Earth as it might be. The deserts are brown, the oceans are blue, the jungles are green. But as you start picking your gaze up slant-wise and you start going through several hundred miles of atmosphere, you start picking up the color of the atmosphere itself. SDS-33, the Earth was a lot more blue. Now, as you pick your eyes up and you start looking through more horizon, it's more of a purple orange. So, again, as Fred said, when you get into uh, sun, high sun angles, the whole color of the Earth is more a purple lavender color when you look out in the distance. Frederick Castell from the French Press Agency to Mario Ronco or Tom Hennen. Does this haziness hamper your observations and do you notice it through the binoculars? Yes, the uh, haziness does hamper the observations, especially uh, as Fred was saying, when you have a, and Story was saying, as a slant range, when you're looking at the uh, observation site on the ground uh, ahead of track and behind track, uh, it clears up uh, when you go overhead near Nader uh, and the haziness uh, gets reduced and you can see pretty well through the atmosphere at that time. Uh, but again, before and after track, it does affect our observation capability. This is Stephen Govain with KTRK-TV. I have a question for anyone. I was with you this past summer when many of you went and visited the Oilers camp and picked up Oilers jerseys with the number 44 on them to commemorate your trip to space. I was wondering if you were aware that the Oilers will be going for the championship on Monday night and if you intended to celebrate that on Monday with wearing of the shirts. I know that one of you has a shirt on board. Uh, that's true. We are carrying one of the Oilers jerseys, and it does have the number 44 on it, but it is in a location in the shell that we do not have access for. We do wish the, wish the team the best of luck, and we are Oilers fans, being from Houston. Uh, Steve, I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, we had a, a picture that our, that our wives sat with us, and uh, each of them is standing next to each other, of course, with the uh, Oilers shirt on with the number 44 in, com in commemoration of SDS 44. This is Laura Tolley with the Associated Press, and for Mario Runco, I was I wanted to ask you, based on what you've seen so far on the military man in space, can astronauts serve the military in space, and, and how? Marge, yes, I believe the astronaut can serve the military in space. The observations uh, I have made and we have made uh, so far have been uh, quite remarkable in terms of what we've accomplished in the past. Uh, they still have a long way to go, however, in terms of the equipment we use and, and, and what can be available on the shuttle or some future space platform. So as a, as a real-time operational asset to the military at the moment, uh, I would say that it, our capabilities would be marginal. However, that may not be true in the future with a little investment in uh, some better equipment and uh, some more training. This is Frank Bass with The Post, and I have a follow-up for Commander Runco. We've heard quite a bit about the two M88-1 experiments, the Battleview and Moses. How has Nightmist been working for y'all? Have y'all had uh, any success in communicating there? Communications have been real good when we have... We have two modes of uh, communications. Uh, one mode we call network, and that's going through... Uh, a network of satellite systems to a uh, field user uh, at the site of observation or close to the site of observation. And then we have another method, uh, a direct method, where we can go from the shuttle to the ground. Uh, unfortunately, on the direct method, when we first got going with that, uh, we had a problem with the connector on our headset. And uh, the radios are working fine, but uh, the means to get the information in and out of the radio uh, has been a problem at this point. Atlantis, that concludes the JSC portion of the press conference. Stand by for a call from the Kennedy Press Center. Atlantis, this is the Kennedy Press Center, and we're ready to begin. Uh, Bill Harwood, United Press Center, yeah, for, for, for Tom Hennon. Uh, can you give us a, uh, we asked you before launch whether uh, military men in space and human observers could, what they could do that satellites can't do. Now that you've been up there first hand and you've been able to look down and see these targets as you go by, what can the human observer in orbit bring to tactical reconnaissance that you can't get just as well or better with the satellite? Well, 
Well, my portion of the uh, the military man space experiment is more on, on on the area of research and development, not so much trying to add to uh, to the current tactical situations from observing on the shuttle. I think Mary could give you some more insight into that particular experiment. Uh, my particular experiment is to kind of characterize how a human observes from this particular environment and try and translate that later on to unmanned sensing devices uh, so we won't have a specific man in the loop, if you will, on orbit. Um, so that particular work is, has a long ways to go. This is the first step in that particular endeavor. And uh, Mario, if uh, you want to give him some more insight to, to direct uh, impact on tactical situations, uh, just give, a, give a shot. I think the, the advantage to uh, a military man in space might be uh, for situations where the tactical field commander doesn't have the information that he needs readily, uh, something like where his adversary might be located. Uh, in that case, if you happen to have a space platform uh, such as the shuttle or a space station or some other future uh, platform in orbit uh, at a time uh, and that station is going overhead of the area where that field commander is operating, in that case, he might be able to help uh, the field commander on the ground and relay the information, and that's kind of what we're, uh, we're working on at this point. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, uh, for Lieutenant Commander Runko. Are you able to see more or less detail with the M88 cameras than you had anticipated, and could you give us some idea of just how much detail you can pick out? I've been seeing more. I'm surprised at what I can see uh, more than what I expected to. Uh, uh, the level of detail I've been getting is uh, I've been able to see uh, large uh, ships and airplanes. That's kind of uh, uh, the level of detail I've been getting at. Uh, whether I can identify those ships as particular types or airplanes, uh, uh, I haven't been able to do, mainly because the imagery I'm getting is uh, kind of at the limit of its resolution, and that's what I was getting at earlier with regard to uh, a little bit better equipment. Beth Dickey with Reuters for Fred Gregory. Before your launch, Dr. Lenore said that the shuttle software would be adapted so the orbiter can land on autopilot. The question is, would you be happy to let the computers take over at that crucial point? <laughs> My pilot said that if I couldn't do it, he'd do it. Uh, at this point, because of the of the limited amount of testing that uh, the auto system has gone through uh, and the, and the uh, single string, essentially, uh, autopilot system, I would feel comfortable allowing it to land if an emergency, if, if neither Tom nor I could land it. But at this point, I would much prefer to land it. This is Irene Brown with Florida Today. I also have a landing question for Fred Gregory. I was wondering if you and Tom Hendricks have, sus have subscribed to the Mike Coates, Brian O'Connor shuttle landing video club to help, you keep, to help keep you prepared for landing after 10 days in space. Yeah, well, we brought it with us, and, and we'll let you know after the fact. <laughs> this is Shuri Stott here with the Orlando Sentinel. I guess it's for Jim Voss. Uh, a couple of you got, like, four-hour stints coming up in the LBNP. I'm just wondering what you plan to do to amuse yourself in that time? Well, the other day I almost took a nap uh, while I was in it for just an hour. For four hours, that's a long time. Uh, I hope that Story can push me up into the inner deck access and let me look out the window for a while while I'm in the uh, lower body negative pressure for four hours. It's quite a long time. So I'll enjoy a four-hour time, which I think about that what the meaning of space flight is. Think about good things to do here, and think about what this experience is. I think it'll be uh, great to have four hours that I'm not uh, racing to follow a checklist and be productive, just four hours to think about space flight and humanity in space. This is Harry Colcom from Aviation Week for uh, Tom Hennon. Uh, are there any observational qualities uh, that surprised you uh, from space as opposed to uh, the work you had done before? Well, I think uh, quite a few. The work I'd done before had never been from this vantage point. It was always after the fact. I think uh, uh, probably one of the biggest things that, that helps the observation, and this is even with the naked eye, uh, and, and let me just say uh, before going on any further that we're not trying to compete with any existing equipment that's 
out there with the equipment that we brought on board uh, Atlantis for this mission. We're just trying to characterize a variety of different observation techniques and skills and ways of doing business. I think probably the biggest thing that it has added from this vantage point is color. Uh, we just don't seem to get the, the tonal qualities, the tonal qualities that you get um, with return, return from space, uh, film-based or electro-optical or digital types of products. They just don't seem to have the same kind of color properties as you have here with your naked eye right out the shuttle window. So probably color is probably the biggest factor that I really hadn't anticipated. And Dan Billow here at WESH-TV mm -hmm. for Story. Uh, Story, you and some of your crewmates have, uh, have shown that, that you're not really afraid to show people you have a sense of humor. Uh, with that in mind, I'd, I'd like to hear how you describe Fred Gregory. <laughs> That's one of the greatest questions around. I guess uh, a lot of us call him Dad. Some is, <laughs> some is call him Granddad. But um, the best way to describe him is a man with a fantastic sense of humor himself. He keeps, uh, keeps us laughing uh, most of the time. I think most of all, uh, he's just dad to us. Ross Cavett with WSTV in Orlando. This especially for the four uh, first-timers up there. This mission, like a couple of the recent uh, missions, is studying the effects of weightlessness on the human body. What effects have you noticed uh, immediately uh, upon going into orbit and, and since you've been up there? Uh, what's been happening to your bodies? What have you noticed that perhaps has been unexpected? Rob Navius, UPI Radio Network, for the Commander. Fred, uh, you served as NASA's Operational Space Flight Safety Chief after the Challenger accident. More than three years after return to flight, how do you view agency-wide attention to safety, and can it be maintained in future years with a heavier flight schedule and four orbiters, coupled with diminished resources and personnel to process those flights? Well, I think before, uh, I, I think before Challenger, we were getting to a point where even I was feeling a little uncomfortable in the program. Uh, after the accident, I think suddenly we became aware that safety was paramount to operational success and mission success and life. Uh, we became very proactive in that uh, safety activity immediately after Challenger, uh, very proactive, and uh, we pulled safety out of organizations such as engineering or operational uh, uh, operations and made them 
that we have now, and I have no reason to believe that our, that the NASA safety program would change at all. This is Dick Uliano, the AP Radio Network. For Commander Fred Gregory, you've landed twice at Edwards. Are you looking forward to adding Kennedy to your resume? And if you do land here, what differences uh, do you expect compared to Edwards? And do you think the painful gout you experienced last time might crop up again? <laughs> yeah, I think that's something my daddy gave me. <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you bring this big bird in, you really don't know where you are until you turn on final about uh, 18 or 19,000 feet above the surface of the earth and about eight or nine miles. And then when you look at a runway or a desert from that position, they all look the same to me. Of course, I would love to land at Kennedy, and I hope the weather cooperates. This is Jim Banky of Florida Today. I have a Star Trek question for Mario. Uh, the show is famous for its special effects drama, and optimistic vision of the future. How does the show compare with the real thing, and how has your spaceflight experience affected your vision of what this nation should do in the future in space? I think Star Trek, uh, embodied by Mr. Roddenberry, uh, his vision of the future of humanity, striving toward goals that are common to all mankind, toward uh, a future where we can work together and see past our differences and work uh, toward uh, the betterment of all human beings and all creatures, whether they be uh, men, uh, the animals on the face of the earth, our environment, or otherwise. And I think uh, in working up here and seeing the perspective, uh, this is uh, uh, a small start in that direction. Uh, we're, we're trying to achieve that. Uh, when you're up here looking at the earth, you get a global perspective. You see past borders. You see the earth as one unit. Go to an Earth News to Story Musgrave. Eight years ago on Challenger's maiden flight, you helped launch the first IUS from the shuttle with Tedris. How different uh, was launching this IUS with the DSP, and how much have you seen changes in the program? Well, one big difference was uh, I launched the IUS on STS-6, and uh, Jim Boss here uh, launched it on STS-44. In a lot of ways, he did a much better job than I did. The IUS is a very mature program. Um, it has not changed a whole bunch since STS-6. It's a very mature program. It's uh, had incredibly good performance and a good record. Don't have much else to say about it. It's a very good program, very successful. Uh, for Commander Gregory, uh, Marsha Dennett, the AP again, uh, you became the second crew in less than three months forced to dodge space junk. Does that worry you, and do you see space junk as an increased risk in flying in space? Well, we have, uh, we did a maneuver the other night to avoid uh, a piece of a rocket. Uh, you know, this is not a crowded area up here. Certainly there's an, there, there's an awful lot of debris up here, but our, our chances of, of running into something, I think, are, are much less than, than hitting somebody in a car in Orlando. I don't have a fear about it. Now, the American, first, uh, the, the American Space Program using the shuttle uh, does not leave any debris in orbit other than liquid that we pump overboard. And so from the shuttle point of view, it's an absolutely clean vehicle. Of course, our solid rocket boosters are, are recaptured or, uh, and recovered in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm sure uh, at one time soon, uh, someone will have a collision with something in space, but I, I don't think it's going to be a major problem. Beth Dickey with Reuters for Story. This is your fourth flight. After this flight, you'll have more hours in orbit than any other shuttle astronaut. What about this particular space flight experience is new to you? Um, Beth, it, first of all, it was a 10-day flight. I love being in space. Give me a 100-day flight, I'd take that one, too. I think the most important thing is it's a 10-day flight. I have had a chance uh, to do some medical experimentation. Uh, the, we are very, very heavy on what we call detailed scientific objectives. We have a lot to do with uh, proving people for longer duration space flights in this particular environment, running some tests like lower body negative as a preventive tool, which we've not done before, even though on Skylab we did look at 
forecasting um, how reaction to Earth would be later. I think those are the two things, 10 days in flight, and I do love space, and also uh, some more medical involvement than I've had in the past. Uh, Lannis, this is the Kennedy Press Center. That concludes our press conference. Thanks for taking the time out to talk with us.